You can go ahead and turn in your Bibles this morning to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 26 through 31 uh, this morning as we continue our study of this book. We're just really getting started, but it's been truly powerful even uh, to date. There was an interesting thing that happened one day in a particular church where uh, Samuel Colgate was a member. He's a famous uh, businessman, American businessman. And it happened during an evangelistic meeting, of uh, actually a, a campaign, uh, like a week-long revival to uh, win people to Christ. But in this particular meeting on that evening, there was a prostitute that had come into the church. And uh, when the invitation was set forth, she came forward and she confessed her sin and uh, trusted Christ. She was truly broken hearted uh, and was weeping openly uh, at, at her condition and, and her need for Christ. She asked God to save her soul and she even went as far as expressing as she was asked to testify of what God was doing in her life. She asked that she might even be able to join this church. And she said, as she asked the question, she said, I'll, I'll gladly sit in some corner in the back. And the, the, the preacher, he hesitated as she, she said that, and, and he, 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 you could tell he was debating, as the account goes, of what to do with her request, and, and he, he just would not call for a, a motion to accept her into membership. And for a few moments, there was silence, and, and actually it was one of those moments where the silence was very, very uncomfortable. And finally, there was a member who thought he'd take the matter in hand, and he stood up and he suggested that the action on her be postponed to a later time. And at, at that moment, Mr. Colgate, he couldn't take it. <laughs> and so uh, he arose and, and he said with an undertone of sarcasm, he said, I guess we blundered when we prayed that the Lord would save sinners. We forgot to specify what kind. We'd, we'd better ask, he went on to uh, say, we better ask the Lord for forgiveness for this oversight on our, par our parts because the Holy Spirit has touched this woman and made her truly repentant. But apparently the Lord does not realize that she isn't the type that we wanted Him to rescue. Now the congregation rightly was shamed by what Mr. Colgate had to say, and then there was a motion put forth, and uh, she was unanimously uh, embraced by the body. It's a great story. It's a great story. And it illustrates the wisdom of God that's spoken of in our text for today here in 1 Corinthians. Let me ask you a question here. Who hasn't, I mean to be honest, who hasn't, wondered at some point in our, our, our life uh, at who God saves and who He doesn't save. I mean, who hasn't wondered about that and looked out at, at, at that and wondered? I mean, we wonder why God doesn't save the great politicians and the great entertainers and the, the, the great uh, uh, athletes. I mean, I'm talking more than just the exception. I'm talking why He doesn't save... Uh, many of these, the, 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 the quote, great minds of our world, why, why, why doesn't He save them? We wonder at why instead He, he saves the lowly, the, the, the down and outers, the prostitutes, the drug addicts, the skid row drunks. Why He even saved us? Why did He save me? We don't have anything to offer Him. But you know what? That's God. That's God. That's, that's our God and that's God's wisdom. That's God's wisdom. And you know what? It's important for us, it's very important for us as we see in this text, to consider who God has saved. To give consideration to who God has saved 
in order to understand His wisdom as much as is possible because we know that our ways are not His ways. We talked about that last week, not only in the, one, uh, in the Old Testament, but also in the New, in Romans there, chapter 11. He's beyond us, but He's given us uh, the ability to look at things and how He works and what He does to, to come to some understanding as it relates to His wisdom. How wise He is. Now I want to read the text for today. It's in chapter 1. It's verses 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brethren, that there are not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that He may nullify the things that are. So that no man may boast before God. But by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. What we learn here is this. Those who have been brought to the saving, saving knowledge of Christ reveal the wisdom of God. Those who have been brought to the saving knowledge of Christ reveal the wisdom of God. Another way to say it, our calling unto salvation reveals God's wisdom or the wisdom of God. Our calling, your calling, my calling, the calling of these believers in this church of God at Corinth. It reveals the wisdom of God. Last week, we looked at the fact that God's wisdom stands alone. It's in a league entirely uh, of its own, God's wisdom. We can't get there. And uh, it's, it's amazing to, to just give that consideration because the Scriptures declare it. Old Testament and New, as I stated a moment ago. Today, though, we see this even uh, more elaborated in those called unto salvation. We see His wisdom manifested, uh, set forth as, uh, as what it is for what it is, and that is, it stands alone. It, it is truly uh, a wonder when you, when you think about it. The question is, is how is His wisdom revealed with the individuals called? Well, in this text, we're going to see two, or make, we're not going to see, we're going to make two observations that will help us see how God's wisdom is revealed in those called, those who have come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Now let's get into our text and make the first observation. And this has to do, one, with the paradox of God's wisdom. The paradox of God's wisdom. Look at verses 26 through 28 again, and I'll read. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that He may nullify the things that are. So that He may nullify the things that are. When you look at what Paul says here, it's like Paul must have went over the membership role at Corinth. He must have went over their role in his mind when he wrote verse 26 there. He reminded them, Purposely, he reminded them that they had very few in their midst who were aristocrats of society, the, the elite of society. Socially, economically, uh, you name it, in whatever category, there were very few in the Corinthian church that were on that particular level. Few who were famous, few who were educated, few who were powerful and influential when they came to Christ. 
Those were not the, the, when you looked out at the body of the Corinthian church, that's not what you saw. And that's what he says to them. He tells them though, consider your calling brethren. And it's in the context of this discussion on the wisdom of God. Because that's what we're looking at, is His wisdom versus the wisdom of the world, worldly wisdom here. And, and, and this whole issue, by the way, uh, this discussion on wisdom, it, it flows in the greater context of divisions within the church. And the reason for the divisions is the, 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 the estimation of oneself as wise. Not looking at God and His wisdom and taking your eyes off of Him and that creating a context for division within the body. But Paul calls on them to consider your calling brethren. He uses, Paul does, if you look, read, read the writings of Paul, and I'm sure many of you have, Paul always uses the term calling. Kaleo is the root. To call or to choose. He uses this term calling to refer to the saving call of God. That efficacious call that results in salvation. So what he's talking about, he's saying, you consider God's call on you that resulted in salvation. His choice of you. I want you to consider your calling in this discussion as it relates to God's wisdom. Let me ask you this. Do you remember what kind of person you were when God called you from the domain of sin? I do. And I'm with the Corinthians. I'm in that, I'm in that group. That's where I would be, in all honesty. And you know what? Most of us would fall in the same category. Maybe not as bad as one over against the other, but in reality, not many powerful, not many influential, not many famous, even within our midst. Famous in our own minds. Legends in our own minds. But the reality is it's our own minds. The fact is, when you look at, at who we were, we were not those kind of people when God called us. Those elite. You know, that He did not accept you as His child because you were wealthy. He didn't accept us because we're intelligent or powerful. The fact is this. When, when you look at Scripture, if you were any of these things, wealthy, powerful, you know, intelligent, you name it. If you were any of these things, you were saved in spite of them, not because of them. Because the Scriptures declare that these very things are a hindrance more than they enhance one's ability to embrace God's grace. That's what Scriptures declare. I want to take you to a couple passages over in Matthew real quick. Look at Matthew chapter 19. For the Sunday school class, this isn't too far removed from where we've been. Matthew 19 and verse 23. And Jesus said to His disciples, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now listen, when the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, then who can be saved? And you know what? That's, that, that, that's, that's a right response. Because <laughs> a camel can't go through the eye of a needle. But listen to this. And looking at them, Jesus said to them, with people this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. While we're in Matthew, go ahead and flip over to chapter 11. I want to read one more verse that... that uh, it, 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 it uh, tails on, on what we've been looking at over in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 11 and verse 25. At the same time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Talk about the, the need for simple faith, not for deeds of greatness, 
to get saved. In fact, those very things can be a real hindrance to one coming to Christ. Realize this, it's not that they cannot be saved, these rich people, these influential people. It's not that they cannot be saved, but because of their accomplishments, because of their standing, because of who they are by the world standard, pride enters in and they rely on self for their security. They, they, it's hard to divorce themselves from the horizontal and embrace the vertical to separate themselves from this, this uh, plane because they're so successful in it. The very things that put them ahead by the world's estimation in actuality can leave them behind with God. That's what scriptures declare. Look at verse 26. For consider your calling, brethren, there were that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. You know what the key phrase is there? Not many. It doesn't say not any, but not many. The M is there. God can save those people. But the reality is, God in His wisdom, by and large, is, He doesn't save those people. He does save them. There are, wise, there are wise, there are powerful, there are intelligent, there are famous people who get saved, but not many. But not many. There are those who, who get saved. There was one little, little whip that I read in the commentary, I liked it. There was a duchess who was saved. And you know what she said? She said, I was saved by an M. Not any, but many. By the M. Because she knew that very few in these positions come to Christ. Wise that are spoken of here, this not many wise, we're talking about intelligent. We're talking about the learned. And, and let's face it, those who consider them the elite, themselves the elite minds of the world are not in the camp of Christianity. Because they view, according to last week's passage, the message of the cross as foolishness. That's what scriptures declare. That's what God says. And I'm telling you, by your own experience, you'd have to acknowledge that. The quote, elite minds, as they classify themselves, are not in the camp of Christianity, for the most part. By and large, by the way. Not many mighty. What are we talking about? The influential. Those who with, have power through politics or in the ancient culture, uh, conquest. They're very powerful individuals. Uh, they, they, have, they, they wield great influence. They're mighty as to their reach. Not many noble speaks of position or station or status within the, 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 the world. Uh, royalty. They, they have, they have a, a, an inheritance. They're, they're people who, by, by whatever means they've arrived, if you will, that's what we would say in our, our euphemisms of our, of our day. But guess what? Not many of these get saved. These things have a tendency to keep people from seeing their need. They do. But here's the paradox of God's wisdom. Let's go ahead and talk about that now. The paradox of God's wisdom in our thinking, as you and I think about things, strength is strength. That's how we see it. Strength is strength. Weakness is weakness. And wisdom is wisdom. I mean, we see it that way. You know, smart, smart. <laughs> strong, strong. Weak is weak. But as far as God is concerned, the things that are seemingly weak the things that are seemingly weak oftentimes are the strongest and vice versa by the work of God. There's the paradox. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's say you're going to form a basketball team and I was going to use football but then I'd have to just take the 85 Bears. <laughs> I didn't want to do that. But let's say you were going to form a basketball team and, and you're going in the basketball business, you get to form a team, and you could play 
you, you, you can actually pick any players throughout the history of, of basketball. Let's say it's a fantasy league. And you can pick any of the basketball players that you choose to build your team. When you start looking at that, you're going to look at who? You're going to look at the Michael Jordans. You're going to look at the, the Kobe Bryants, the Scotty Pippins, the Larry Birds, the Kareem Abdul-Jabbars, the Wilt Chambers, LeBron James. You're going to look at Kevin Durant. You're going to look at the best. You're going to, that's who you're going to pick for your basketball team. That's only logical. If you're going in the basketball business, that's what you're going to pick. You're going to pick those players, the greatest names. You're going to pick those. But when you, when you go forward with this, and let's think this way, you're going in the salvation business. Let's go in the salvation business. And you have to choose people to proclaim the gospel, to lead people from the pit of hell to a relationship with Christ. And that's the goal. What type of people are you going to choose? Probably you would choose world leaders. You choose the people with the greatest influence in the world. You'd want the powerful. You'd want the famous. To, to, to bring people to Christ. It seems logical. They got the biggest field of influence. But guess what? That's not God. That's not God's wisdom. That's not how God works. That's not God's way. Notice verses 27 and 28. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not so that He may nullify the things that are. God, folks, is in the salvation business and look who, he's, who He has chosen. Would you just look at it? Would you just look at it? He chose the foolish to shame the wise. Levi got <laughs> a little inside joke there. The foolish He chose to shame the wise. The weak to shame the strong. He chose the base and the despised and what He calls those who are not, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are. And you know what every one of us should say? I'm going to say it. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that He didn't look for the best possible players in the world. For this work. His wisdom was to take the very lowest and make them his champions. Make them his church. Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm here. I'm telling you, I'll be honest with you. I'm here on that principle. On the wisdom of God alone. That's why I'm here. Wasn't anything in me, and guess what? If you're honest, there wasn't anything in you. It was God's grace, and it's His wisdom. And it was for a purpose that we'll get to. Listen, God reveals the greatness of His power and His wisdom, and His wisdom by demonstrating that by and in Christ, the world's nobodies can become His somebodies. That's his wisdom. The people that the world would say are refuse, God says, give them here. I'm going to call them unto myself and save their souls. And they're my somebodies. They're my servants. They're my church. They're a royal priesthood. They're my children. Can you, can you fathom that? I mean, go home and just sleep on that one. Well, don't sleep on it. Meditate on it. Praise God. What do you think? Let me illustrate this for you. What do you think of this type of man? This wisdom of God. What do you think of this type of man? No education. No trade or profession. No money. No military rank. No social prestige. No political pos position. 
No impressive appearance or oratory. By the world's standard, he is a nobody. He's a nobody. Yet Jesus said of this man, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. That's the wisdom of God. It's mind-blowing. But from our perspective, can you not see His wisdom in the choosing? I think you will when you start looking at His purpose in His wisdom and how He works, because that's where we're going next. This is the wisdom of God. But now let's look at the second observation that causes us to see His wisdom in those that He's called to salvation. Look at 29 through 31. Well, let's pick it up 28, the last part. So that He may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God, but by His doing, but by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that just as it is written let him who boasts boast in the Lord what we have here in the second observation is this the purpose of God's wisdom the reason he chose the lowly the downtrodden the weak the 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 uh, the ones mentioned here, those, those that the world would throw off by their standard of measure, He chose those, and it reveals, for, I mean, what we see in this observation is it's for a purpose. And the purpose, the purpose is this. And, and we don't have to spend a lot of time because it's so clear. What, what is it? Beyond the fact that we just looked at nullifying the things that are, that are, that is the things the world props up as great, God nullifies those. Because what, what, what the world says, this is why you, God, should acknowledge these people. This is why God should take notice. God says, that's foolish. He nullifies it by His calling of, the, of those down and outers. The primary purpose, folks, in God's wisdom is that in the end, He alone is glorified. The reason God works the way He works is that in the end, He alone is glorified. He alone receives the glory. Verse 29, look at it. What it says, so that no man may boast before God. No man can boast before God. The truth is this, man can do nothing for himself. Scriptures declare it. Read Romans 3. That's what God says. He gives you a very clear description of lost man. And he is hopelessly, in and of himself, utterly depraved, apart from God, and without hope in himself. He can do nothing to change that. There isn't anything he can do to change that. Not one thing. Yet, what we find is that God takes those who can do nothing and he uses them as an object lesson of his wisdom. Because when you start thinking of hopeless people, you think of the weak, the base, the foolish, all of the world's uh, all of the world's throw-offs, and you look at them by the world's standard of measure, you'd think that they're the, the, they're the worst of the worst, and yet God saves them in their condition. And they reflect His very wisdom. They reflect His wisdom. And guess what? i got to throw this in here. He alone can save the not many's as well. Only He can get the camel through the eye of the needle. And he does. He saves some. But his wisdom, his wisdom is in how he calls these people to demonstrate that the world's wisdom and their standard of measure, it isn't even right. Because what they've propped up is achievement in and of oneself to gain God's 
blessing or grace. And what he's saying is, no, I'm not going to do it that way. In fact, the reason I'm not going to do it that way is because no man will ever stand before God, before him, and boast. I, I don't know what that means to you, but to me, I think it's wonderful. Because I never had anything to boast in. I knew that in my lost condition. I think every person, if they're truly saved, comes to that place. And if you haven't come to the place where you know that you're hopelessly lost before a holy God, then I'd question whether you're saved. Because how can you turn to Him unless you know you're totally lost? I need Him. I need Him. And He... he saves us the way He does by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. The reason He saves that way is He's so structured it in His wisdom that no one can say that I did my part. I made myself worthy of your Saving me of your looking, noticing me. No, he doesn't do that. He takes the prostitutes. He takes the drug addicts. He takes the skid row drunks. He takes the people who realize they're nothing without him. Absolutely depraved and lost without him. Those are the ones he calls. Because those are the ones that reflect the wisdom. And, and the wisdom is in the plan. He sent His Son, the cross. It was a plan that the world said is totally foolish. He sent His Son. He dies on the cross and He provides for us. And that's what we find here. That's where He goes in, in this verse 30. Look at this. Look at verse 30. But Now listen to this too. I want you to see this. But what? By His doing. Not yours and His. Not... not Anybody added in there, not any achievement, but by His doing, by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus. What's that saying? He saved you. You did not save yourself. You didn't have any part in it. Well, wait a minute. I believed. Well, yes, you did. And so did I. But we're told in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that, not of yourself. That's the wisdom of God. Do you understand that? That's the wisdom of God. Because there isn't going to be any one of us who stand before Him on any different ground than grace. Not one of us. And we're all going to be on our faces because we're going to know that He did it all. He saved me. And He alone could. That's His wisdom. He takes the potential for boasting completely out of the equation. And that's His wisdom. There isn't going to be anybody who's ever going to be able to say to the Lord, I deserved to be saved. It's just not going to happen. Because everybody there is going to already know that if we didn't, and He saved us. And that's His wisdom. It says, By His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us, look at these beautiful words, He became wisdom from God. He became to us wisdom from God. He is our wisdom. People say you're an idiot for trusting Christ, for being a Christian. Well, guess what? I may be an idiot, but my wisdom is Jesus Christ. My wisdom is Jesus Christ. And my Jesus Christ and the plan of God that you deem foolish is in reality the wisdom of God. It, that's what we're told. It's the wisdom of God. But yet to the world, it's weak, lame, a fable, a myth. It's not even worthy of consideration. And, a, and all those who embrace this are a bunch of morons. That's what we saw last word. That's the term, moria. It's moronic to believe this. Well, guess what? He became to us the wisdom of God. He's my wisdom. 
When people want to talk about wisdom, I just point them to Jesus. Point them to Jesus. He became our righteousness. He became to us righteousness. Guess what we needed? We needed righteousness to stand before a holy God. And because He is our righteousness, we stand righteous before God. That's the wisdom of God. He became our sanctification. Our ground for holiness in this life and in the ultimate sanctification of all saints when we stand before God at the, at the Bama Seat judgment, blameless as it relates to our lost condition. He set us apart unto His glory. He became to us redemption. Redemption. The purchase price to redeem us from the marketplace of sin. And guess what the price was? You know what it was. His precious blood. His precious blood. What are we talking about? We're talking about God's wisdom. That's what this is all about. This is the wisdom of God. And I'm going to tell you, if you read this, I mean, and go back and read this. Again, spend the time and read this. And you have to say, nobody, no human mind works this way. We don't work this way. But God does. And for those on the, this side of the cross, knowing Him, we can look back and we can see very clearly the wisdom of God in doing it exactly how He did it if His purpose is to receive and be glorified in what He does. See, He doesn't share His glory. And you know what? Some of you may think, well, what a selfish person. Well, you could say it that way, but what I'm going to tell you is, is there's no other glory to share. We're not worthy of it. He shares it as we come in through the Son. We're joint heirs with Jesus. We're seated at the right hand. I mean, we're seated in that, not the right hand. He's at the right, but we're seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2. We're seated there. He does share it in that regard, but only through His Son. And as it relates to salvation, the saving of the lost person, He alone gets the, the glory. That's what it says in closing this out. Look at it, verse 31. So that, so that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast where? In the Lord. In the Lord. Our boast is in the Lord. And we reveal by our calling, our individual calling, we're a reflection of the wisdom of God. Because we can, our boast is solely in the work of Jesus Christ. And God gets all the glory, as it should be. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we love you today, and we thank you again for your word. We thank you for your wisdom. And, and Lord, though we look at our own selves and we wonder at that wisdom, whether it, 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 as, it, as it relates to who we are, and, and we're, we're, we're blown away, but yet when we see your purpose, that, that you alone are to receive the glory, you alone are to be the boast of the, the lost person saved, there's wisdom, great wisdom in that. And we thank you for that. I thank you, Lord, uh, for each one who, who's come out today. And I do pray that your word, Lord, would uh, just set down upon each one of us, that we would reflect upon it, and that uh, we would just be uplifted at what we've learned here and what we've spent time in. I thank you uh, for this day and the fellowship we might enjoy one with another. I just pray that you would bless that. I pray for your blessing as always upon our club ministries this evening as well. And I just ask that you would bless this week ahead of us. May we truly shine for you and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.